What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I'm always contending for the faith once for all, delivered to the saints. And today, we're going to play a little game called Pin the Tail on the Antichrist. <laughs> Now, this is a popular game that evangelicals love to play uh, for a long, long time. Google search Charles Darby and you'll start to understand how long this game has been being played, how it plays into idiot ideas like pre, mid, or post-millennialism, uh, dispensationalism, all the rapture, all sorts of crazy, stupid things. But in this time during the church's calendar, as she comes to the end of the church year, uh, beginning of the year again at Advent, uh, the church in her lectionary is focusing on the end of the world. And this past Sunday, we may have played the game, Pin the Tail on the Antichrist. Now, I've heard lots of people pin the tail on the Antichrist before. The current Antichrist apparently is President Trump. Prior to that, it was Obama. Um... Prior to that, heaven knows. Um, I don't know. Is it really Nikolai Carpathia? I, I have no idea. But what's funny is mainline American Protestantism loves to look to political leaders. What we heard in church on Sunday from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians was that the Antichrist, with all of his marks, is going to come from within the church, from amongst God's own people. And he is going to set himself up in the temple of God and claim to be God. So before we begin, uh, who's the craziest person you've ever heard is the Antichrist and why? <laughs> Drop a comment down in the comment section below uh, and we'll meet you there and we'll have a good, good solid laugh. Uh, so, no, we're not talking about Nikolai Carpathia. Um, sorry, Kirk Cameron. It's not Nikolai Carpathia. Um, <laughs> there's actually a, a sign on a, a, the major interstate that runs past my town, um, south of my town, that says that the Messiah has come and it's so-and-so. Uh, um, an Antichrist, uh, definitely. The, <sighs> I'm going to pin the tail on the Antichrist, and Protestants are going to get really excited about it, but we're going to circle back around to Protestants. The thing to remember about the Antichrist, before I pin the tail on him, is that he's going to deny the gospel. And that's really key. So when I say, with all sincerity and all certainly, as God is my witness and the scriptures by my side, the office of the papacy is the Antichrist. You hear the Protestants going, Yay! <laughs> I'm going to come back to you, Protestants. It is because the Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Trent has anathematized the gospel. Now, Anathema is a big theological term. Uh, we're familiar with the word when Paul said, even if I or an angel from heaven should come to you and preach to you a gospel other than the one that we proclaimed, let him be anathema, eternally condemned. Now, at the Council of Trent in the mid-1500s, the Roman Catholic Church was answering the Lutheran and at the same time, the Protestant piggybackers onto the Lutheran Reformation. I shudder to call it the Protestant Reformation because any Protestant that got their hands on the Lutheran Reformation just <laughs> mucked. They mucked it up. I almost said something else that would have been appropriate to say, but we're going to go with they mucked it up. <laughs> so in response to this Reformation, Rome at the Council of Trent anathematized, said, let them be eternally condemned. Any and all people who believe that one is justified by grace through faith in Christ alone. They anathematized anyone who believes the gospel. 
and later in another article at the Council of Trent because they were just whipping out anathemas, just anathema this, anathema this, anathema this, like teenagers at a strip club. That was the Roman Catholic Church, just anathema, 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 ooh, anathema, because that's what the church is called to do. So they're whipping out these anathemas. In addition to anathematizing anyone who believes the gospel, they anathematized anyone who believes that the work of Christ is sufficient. That's right. If you believe that the cross was sufficient, that the merit of Christ, the benefits won at the cross, given to you in baptism and at the Lord's Supper, are not sufficient. Or Yeah, if, if you believe those are sufficient, if you believe the phrase, it is sufficient, finished. Anathema. You have to work towards your salvation. You have to suffer in purgatory. There is still a debt to be paid, and if you don't think so, you're eternally condemned. But, Ryan, the Council of Trent was written in, like like you said, the mid-1500s. It has not been redacted. It has not been recanted of. So, the Pope... His, by his office, has anathematized the gospel itself. And what, uh, and, and, and from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, yes, the Pope has set himself up in the temple of God and has proclaimed himself to be God. How do we know this? Because the Pope is above correction. You can't correct the Pope. The church cannot, by her authority given to her by Christ, look at the Pope and say, no, that is not doctrinally sound. You have erred. The Pope does not err, especially when he speaks ex cathedra. That's right. When the Pope speaks ex cathedra, it doesn't matter what he says, even if it contradicts the Bible, it is God's word. Now, Protestants still going, yeah, preach it. (sighs) There is a spirit of Antichrist in the Bible, isn't there? Not just a man, not just a man of lawlessness that we can look to and we can look at popes past, present, and say, yep, you you fit the bill. All, All of the markers of the Antichrist in the scripture we can clearly apply to you. Protestants, you have your own, don't you? Joel Osteen. Joyce Myers, T.D. Jakes, Beth Moore, Stephen Furtick, pretty much anyone on the Trinity Broadcasting Network, Rick Warren is an antichrist. Any mainline mega church preacher has denied the gospel because they, and they're not doing anything different than Rome. Rome at least came right out and said it and said, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. When a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Give me money, and you and your loved one can go to heaven. What do most Protestant preachers teach today? Give me money, and you will get a blessing. Protestants, you've exchanged one form of papal authority for another, and it's hitting you right in the pocketbook. I'm sorry. So, There's only one thing, biblically, that Christians contribute to their own salvation. Well, two things that we contribute to our own salvation. Sin and resistance. All of the verbs in the Bible that are related to our salvation are passive on our part. Things being done by God to us. So, if we believe, as Rome would have us believe at Trent, that we are justified by grace through faith in Christ alone and that the work is complete we are eternally condemned. Almost like the Bible doesn't say there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I mean, if the Bible were to come right out and say there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, then we would know that the anathemas of the Roman Catholic Church are stupid. But the Bible doesn't know. Yeah, it does. Well, I mean, if the Bible would just say that we're justified by grace through faith, uh, it says that too. Ah, uh, speaking of twos, James 2, Ryan, 
James 2. Well, the pretext to any proof text is an absolute lack of context. The entire book of James is about what we see on our side of eternity and how we can know, discern, judge not uh, in the sense that you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, we're not God, but to discern rightly who is or is not in the faith. The only thing we have to go on is works. It's like looking at a car and wondering if the engine is running. There are, there are things that you would look for that would tell you whether or not the car is running. That's kind of the whole point of James. Ooh, I'm sorry. I've, I've got to cut myself off here because we need to think about this car analogy a little bit better. Okay, so if the book of James is like looking at a car to determine whether or not it's running, what the Roman Catholic Church says is, that one passage in James says that you've got to start your own car. What James is actually saying is we're just looking to see whether or not the car is running. God has already started the car. We're just checking to see is the battery dead. And if it is, that's your fault. So the analogy still works. A d just like a car cannot start itself, a person cannot decide for Jesus, a, a car can't start itself because it's dead. It's just, it's an inanimate object. We are dead in trespasses and sins. We cannot save ourselves. God has to do the work. So God is the one that starts the car. And the whole premise of the book of James is whether or not the car is running and how do we know? But it's not the exhaust that we see that's, that, that, started the car it's not the rumbling of the the hood or the warmth of the hood that started the car god did the work and put into motion all of the things that naturally happen when a car is started the fruit the good works that we're looking at to determine if a person is a christian flow naturally from the Christian, going back to Jesus' vine analogy. He's the vine, we're the branches. You know, been or been grafted into the vine. A branch has to be grafted into a vine by someone else, by the gardener. And once a vine has been grafted, or a branch has been grafted into the vine, it must, it naturally, it just does produce fruit. Why? Because of the works, worthiness, and merit of the branch? Hell no. Because of the vine. Because of what naturally flows from the vine into the branch. Good works don't save and contribute nothing to salvation. One out of context verse from the book of James does not undo the whole of scripture. I just had to interrupt myself uh, to get that out there. So thank you very much. And now uh, back to you, Ryan. So yeah, James does make that statement about faith and works. But there's a context to it. And the whole context of the whole rest of Scripture, to include Jesus literally saying, you didn't choose me, I chose you, that says we are justified by grace through faith in Christ alone. And Protestants, you deny this too. I'm sorry, you are your own antichrists. You are your own little popes. Because you hold, oh, you're saved by grace. So just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Ah, it's a work. If it's a work, it's law. Oh, you're saved by grace alone as a free gift, but you got to open the gift. Ah, 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 that's a work. If it's a work, it's law. We're not justified by the law. We're justified by grace. Grace is unearned, unmerited favor of God. That we believe that we cannot, by our own reason or strength, believe in our Lord Jesus Christ or come to him. But we have been called by the gospel, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, kept and sanctified in the one true Christian church. Not by our own works, worthiness, or merit. No, 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 no. We have been purchased, bought back, redeemed. Look. The reason we're talking about pin the tail on the Antichrist right now is because we are at that time of the year where the church is thinking of the end times, the end of days, Judgment Day. Okay, and while the world is looking to Greta Thunberg for salvation, we look to Christ. 
we know that the world is going to continue as it always has until Christ comes. Maybe before I finish this video, maybe in 20,000 years. But while we're looking at pin the tail on the Antichrist, let us not forget in this season of eschatology, this end time season of the church, that our hope has always been in Judgment Day, the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. How many Christians today have exchanged the true hope of the Christian faith that just as Christ was raised from the dead, so too shall we. And he will destroy heaven and destroy earth and create a new heaven and a new earth, and we will live and reign with him in our bodies for all of eternity. We're exchanging our hope what? The temporal state in which our soul and our body is separated? Let's look at Pin the Tail on the Antichrist as a game that we play, not to accuse but to defend, not to accuse the Pope, not to accuse televangelists, but to cling to the hope that is the gospel. And the gospel being nothing other than the proclamation of good news of what Christ has done. We're not going to play pin the tail on the Antichrist so that we can say whatever we want about whoever is in political power. I happen to think the governor of my state is fundamentally evil. Well, I'm talking to you, Tony Evers. Um, I don't think he's the Antichrist. I don't expect him to be. He's not from within the church. Paul always warns us to watch those who proclaim the good news to us. And we've seen over the course of history that it is the Pope who consistently claims the authority of God. I mean, to, to the title of Vicar of Christ on Earth, which means more to people in the 16th century than it does to us, but it is a hardcore serious claim. The Council of Trent in the 1540s, which has not been recanted of. Yes, the office of the papacy is the Antichrist. Does this mean Roman Catholics are condemned? No. No. Does this mean individual popes are the Antichrist? No. Pope Francis is a hippie. He's not the Antichrist. Well... Mm, definite maybe. <laughs> Look, I'm not talking about any particular man. I'm talking about the office. So the hope of the Christian is not in, can we pin the tail on the Antichrist? The hope of the Christian is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has been crucified, dead, and buried in our place, and is now risen and ascended into heaven to plead at the right hand of the Father on our behalf. And he will come again in glory to judge both the living, and the dead. Until next time, may God richly bless you. The grace and the mercy completely won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.